I must go on and introduce Rhino, who is an old, old friend of, uh, of mine. I first met him, I think, in the 1980s or thereabouts, which must be about 40 years ago now. Um, and we're all much older. And he has a distinction that he became a director of a national museum. And the Irish had the good, good sense to appoint someone who knew about objects to be a director of a national museum, which is not a, as, as what happens elsewhere. But anyway, uh, welcome, Rhino, and give us um, your take on Irish personal seals. Thank you, John. I think that's that screen up now. Bear with me. Oops. Share. Okay. All right. Oops. Yeah. Is this, can you see this? Hello? Yep, yep, yes, you're, yeah. you're very clear. You've gone on to slide two. Okay, so I just start at the beginning, yep. okay? Start at the beginning, clear now. Yep. yeah. Right. Um, okay, uh, well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction, and it's good to see you after all these years. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you for the kind invitation to speak at this conference, which um, I'm delighted to get back into this subject, which is a, a, a subject that I uh, did some research on many, many months ago. And um, what um, I'm talking about today is basically just a, a preliminary work towards what I hope will be a, a, um, a major project on uh, the seals of medieval Ireland. Um, now, the study of Irish seals is one which has been neglected for over a century, and I'm conscious that this material will be uh, will not be will be new to most people, including many Irish people. I might add. Therefore, what I offer here is a general overview of the subject as it currently stands. It's based largely on published sources and the few images of seal matrices which have been photographed, because this subject, as you'll see, is is fairly poorly researched. The conclusions arrived at therefore must be regarded as preliminary and from the first and form the first step in what I hope will be more comprehensive understanding of seals and seal usage in medieval Ireland. As elsewhere, the subject of seal geography was popular in Ireland in the 19th and early 20th centuries, but interest in the subject has waned thereafter. A large proportion of the surviving Irish seal matrices were collected at this time in the, during the 19th, early 20th centuries, most of which are now preserved in the collections of the National Museum of Ireland. The study of Irish seals reached its peak in the early 20th century, primarily to the work of E.C.R. Armstrong, Keeper of Irish Antiquities at the National Museum of Ireland. His monograph on Irish seal matrices and seals published in 1913 is still the only re reference on the subject covering seals from the medieval through to the modern period. These came from the cabinets of a small number of 19th century private collectors who seem to have uh, cornered the market in uh, seals matrices. In his monograph, Armstrong listed 62 medieval seal matrices, of which three quarters were either ecclesiastical, heraldic, or equestrian, and only a quarter could be classified as personal, so that's the top row there. Um, this reflects an inherent bias in the interest of 19th century collectors, where the study of seals was largely confined to those of identifiable churchmen and institutions, and the seals of lay sigillants with recognisable Irish names. They also reflect an interest in heraldry, and in particular the question of when heraldry was adopted by the Irish. Since Armstrong's time, as further seal matrices have come to light, both as new finds and through literature search, it has been possible to get at least some indication of the range of medieval seal matrices which were used in medieval Ireland um, since uh, Armstrong wrote. And the profile uh, of seals has changed dramatically. As you can see in the period um, since 1913, um, the vast majority of seals, almost all were uh, personal seals. 
and there is a further group of metal detected uh, seals which have yet to be examined, mostly of lead alloy. Consequently, today a total of around 140 matrices, medieval seal matrices, are known from Ireland, to which may be added some 60 papal bullae recorded as having been found in Ireland, but I won't be dealing with them here. The table here then shows that the total number of medieval seals since Armstrong's day has doubled. The number of personal seals has increased by a factor of five, accounting for almost 60% of the total. And of course, this raises the question of whether these seals were being found in the 19th century, but not being collected or not being recognized. They certainly didn't enter public collections. And no new equestrian or heraldic matrices have come to light since uh, Armstrong's time. And finally, there's been a substantial increase in lead alloy seals since 1913. Many of these um, in this, amongst this metal detected group, uh, which have yet to be examined. The holdings of the National Museum of Ireland, I should say, also include several hundred wax seal impressions and casts collected by Armstrong, which have yet to be catalogued. Only five seal matrices have been found from archaeological excavations. I think we heard that um, last week as well. And all are personal seals. They include the only two Irish medieval matrices of bone, one of which is shown on the left, that of Adam the Chaplain, found in the course of excavations in Dublin Castle in dump ditch deposits. Uh, and one on the right is from excavations at Grand Parade Cork, found again in a deep redeposited context. Around the central fleur de lis, uh, the Cork uh, example has the name of the sigilant Adam de Gold, and the Gold or Gould family were to become one of the principal merchant families in the city of Cork through the medieval and into the early modern period. So far I've been discussing matrices, but coming to uh, seals themselves, the situation is far more difficult. It is very difficult to get a a sense of the numbers of, med of extant medieval Irish seals that have been preserved in public archives, and no comparable study to those such as by Lang or Birch have been undertaken for Ireland. A large proportion of Irish seal medieval records were lost when the record store in the public record office in Dublin was destroyed by fire in June 1922 during the course of the Irish Civil War. This was only the latest in a pattern of loss through fire damage and neglect to befall Irish medieval records. While a large number of these records were published both before and after 1922, the principal concern was to record their contents and the presence of seals was only noted in passing, if at all. It is also clear that the seals had become detached or were deliberately removed from documents and that others survive in poor condition. The largest single collection of medieval records now extant in Ireland is that was that kept by the Butler Earls of Ormond, collectively known as the Ormond Deeds, now preserved in the National Library of Ireland. Though calendars, the seals have never been studied and only a few have been photographed. An estimated, an estimated 1,300 seals survive, though many are damaged and fragmentary. The only su substantial archive of ecclesiastical medieval records are those of the cathedral of the Holy Trinity Dublin, known collectively as the Christchurch Deeds. These, however, were destroyed in the fire of 1922, but luckily the principal deeds were copied in the 18th century and include drawings of some 50 seals which remain to be studied in detail. And you see at the bottom right there, one uh, a personal seal of uh, Richard, one Richard of Castle Martin attached to a deed of 1220. Few parochial records survive. One set associated with the parish of St. John in Dublin are now preserved in Trinity College Library. A selection of seals was drawn for publication by Armstrong when he wrote a note on the seals to accompany the calendar of the deeds which was published. I'll refer to these uh, later in uh, my talk. Smaller numbers of seals survive in other public archives, including an estimated 300 Irish seals in the National Archives in Kew. The number of extant Irish seals of pre-1600 date is just thus at present unknown. The best guesstimate, and it is only that, is that it would be calculated in the low to mid thousands 
possibly around three to 4,000, a number comparable to those catalogued in the Seals of Medieval Wales project. There are no certain instances of seals in use, seal use in Ireland before the 12th century. The earliest seal charters in the European tradition in Ireland were drawn up in favour of Cistercian houses, the majority of which were found, founded from other houses in England. The use of seals certainly predates the Anglo-Norman conquest of Ireland in 1169, though the use of seals did not become widespread until the arrival of Anglo-Norman settlers and their retainers, many of whom became major landowners in much of the south and east of the country. Others would have settled in the major towns such as Dublin, Cork, Kilkenny and Drada, attracted by the rights and privileges granted to free purchases. It is no surprise, therefore, to learn that Ireland generally follows the development of seals in terms of form, design and motifs found in contemporary England, Scotland and Wales. The scale of this settlement in the wake of the Anglo-Norman conquest is best reflected in the Dublin Guild Merchant Rolls, shown on the screen here, a document listing those admitted as free men to the city in the 13th century. This map shows the geographical origin as recorded in the by names of those entered in the rolls. And as you can see, the preponderance of names of individuals from the south and west of Britain and from the Welsh marshes in particular is clearly evident. One of these individuals was no doubt the owner of this cancelled lead seal with the motif of a centaur with bow and arrow found during the course of excavations at High Street, Dublin, just close by the uh, cathedral in the centre of the medieval town. The sigilant's name, Adam Bjorsten, suggests that he was originally from Boriston in Shropshire and is surely his nephew, Thomas, who's recorded in the Dublin Guild Merchant Rolls. The earliest extant equestrian seals in Ireland are those of the Anglo-Norman knights who participated in the Anglo-Norman conquest, such as this double-sided seal of Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, known as Strongbow, Earl of Pembroke, who was famously married to Aoife, daughter of Dermot MacMurra, King of Leinster, who was responsible for bringing the um, uh, Anglo-Normans to Ireland in the first place. Along with the figure of the mounted baron on the right, it carries the figure of the standing knight holding a shield for the arms of the Clare family. And this would have been the seal that would have been used by de Clare in uh, both um, Britain and in Ireland. Other seals belonging to lesser knights, like these attached to the statues of Duisk Abbey in Kilkenny, are smaller and are single sided. In the case of that on the left, though the legend is unclear, it is interesting that the by name of the sigilant. Adam Petted is rendered in the accompanying deed using the Irish form Adam Beg, Beg is the Irish term for small or young. This was a byname commonly used by Irish kings and lords to donate, denote younger sons and represents an early example of cultural, affiliation, uh, cultural accommodation found uh, on seals. The use of the equestrian device was soon adapted by Irish provincial kings and local chieftains. One of the earliest is a silver matri matrix used by Philip O'Connor, king of the Western prom province of Connacht on the left. The silver matrix was found in the early 17th century, but is now only known from a drawing made by the Irish antiquary and historian, Sir James Ware. The seal would appear to have been finely engraved. And interestingly, the king's forename, Phelimid, modern Phelim, has been accurately, accurately rendered by the engraver, along with his title as King of Connacht. Phelim had allied himself to powerful Anglo-Norman magnate in an attempt to secure his contested kingdom under threat from both Irish and Anglo-Norman rivals. His father had tried to secure his land by charter from the English king in an attempt to secure feudal succession for his heirs. According to Ware, an impression of this very seal attached to a letter from Phelim to King Henry III uh, survived uh, in the records in London, although it can not, no longer be traced. Another royal equestrian seal matrix, this time of copper alloy, is that shown on the right uh, of Brian O'Neill, King of Tyrone, who is given the title Regis de Kedel Ogan, which is the Irish rendering of the um, area under which he held sway. 
The equestrian device in a simplified and reduced form remained popular in Ireland, especially among lesser kings and chieftains throughout the 13th and 14th centuries. Modest in size, measuring five centimeters in diameter or less, their use of silver indicates the importance of their owners, though size does not necessarily equate with status. A group of these small silver matrices carry a variety of devices, those of Don Logue McCarthy, uh, King of Desmond, and Machan McNamara, the two on the left, who is styled as Duchess or Lord of Hesept of the Ecashin in County Clare, his name rendered in a mixture of Latin, Irish, and English for equestrian. The seals of Brian O'Brien and Donna O'Brien on the right carry images of a griffin and a galley, respectively. It is unlikely that these latter are to be considered as heraldic devices. But what is significant is the fact that in the 14th century, there was a demand for seal matrices from local kings, which were required to authenticate documents. As there was no tradition of the use of documents requiring seals between Irish kings or lords, these seals were, must have been used in land transactions with the church and with the administ English administration. Returning to the range of personal seals now, I illustrate here a number of the more interesting examples. This silver seal of Vivian de Aula found in County Meath contains a central device, which is an obvious play on the name of the owner. In this case, a single roof building or hall or aula. This is a rare survival of a silver matrix of an owner of Anglo-Irish, Anglo-Norman origin, uh, and it may well have been brought to Ireland from England or Wales. The Fleur motif, de Lee motif appears on a number of seals of individuals bearing both English and Irish names. In the case of the seal on the right, the engraver rendered the first name of the sigillant close to its Irish form Dubnal, for what would now be Donal or Donald. Uh, rather than the Latinized Domnaldos, while his surname Kimenach, the modern Kavana, is expressed more phonetically. So this this interesting play and use of the um, of language uh, is it, it finds itself uh, throughout as a motif throughout uh, the, the period. A more elaborate design of fully rigged galley is found on this impression of a lead alloy seal matrix of Walter Champion found at the port town of Drada in the last century. The original is now lost, but the reverse was described as bearing scroll rock decoration similar to that found on the Breek Cathedral chapter seal now in the National Museum of Scotland. And we saw examples of such foliate decoration last week used on lead seals uh, found in Britain. Uh, there's a number shown last week from the PAS database. The silver matrix of William, son of William of London, found in Ireland and now in the British Museum, is a more ambitious affair, bearing the motif of a hawk seizing a bird. The question here again is whether William Seal was made in Ireland or was brought by him to Ireland. The fact that he's called William to London doesn't necessarily mean that he was actually physically from London and he could have actually been uh, based in Ireland. Another example, interesting example in the British Museum, is this anonymous matrix showing a spurred cock bearing the inscription, immutable signal, an unchanging sign. It was discovered at Flood Street, Kilkenny in 1859. And this was the site of a market in the Middle Ages in the town of Kilkenny and may represent casual loss on the part of its owner or perhaps even of its seller. Other small private seals from Ireland include seals with the more common legends such as Pri Vesu and Elasius V Pri. A couple of matrices carrying the motif of paired peacocks flanking a tree or cross uh, are known also. This example only known from a publication uh, early in the uh, last century carries the name of the owner Alexander whose by name is unclear. And it could be the Irish surname, or it could be uh, Erothlin, O'Rothlin, or it could be uh, Roslin, it's unclear. And without actually examining the original, it's very difficult to um, be certain. The second uh, seal with a, a pair of peacocks 
is anonymous, buried the legend, Deo servire regnare est, to serve God is to reign, which ultimately is a quotation uh, from the 11th century Benedictine monk, Peter Damien. And it'd be interesting to know whether uh, anybody has discovered uh, a seal with a similar legend. Women's seals are far less common and no matrix of silver or copper alloy has so far been found. Those that do survive can be pointed oval or circular in form. These I'm talking about both seals and seal matrices. However, some seals of elite women, such as the seal of Joan, wife of Hugh Lebigat in the Ormond Deeds, shows a standing figure in a long gown holding a lily in one hand, by that of Amos, wife of Walter Cusack, also in the Ormond Deeds, depicts a standing female with long dress and pillbox hat and veil. However, uh, these have not been photographed, so I, I am only going by the description given in the calendar records. It is likely that these were of cast copper alloy, if not of silver. Seal matrices of women of lesser status are of lead alloy and include this fleur de lis as the central device on the seal of Maud. Um, a metal detected find from a lake dwelling in the Irish Midlands, while another belonging to Alex Fitzphilip, also of lead and a pointed oval, bears a crescent moon and a star. Other women employed anonymous seals, such as that used by Catherine Hannan of the right, who sealed a deed in Galway in 1394 with a device bearing a chained how, or is it after last week, is it a lion? I leave that with you. Among the seals recorded, but unfortunately not illustrated by Armstrong, is that used by Johanna de Mospulin in 1302, which bore the figure of a lion and the inscription in French, Je suis rey de best, I am the king of beasts, a motto derived from the description of the lion in the medieval bestiaries. There are some gem set seals which have an association with Ireland, but in the absence of names, it is unclear whether all of these were actually found in Ireland or represent collector's items. One such as this silver seal of unknown provenance in the National Museum of Ireland, inscribed Ece Agnus Dei with the Cornelian gem engraved with a lamb and flag. Another, which will be very familiar to you, is this example in the British Museum, set with an antique sard bearing the head of Hercules. It is said to have been found in Ireland and is inscribed, qui me porte si le mousse, he who carries me fares best. It would be interesting to actually try and track down if more is known uh, about this seal to establish whether indeed it was actually found in Ireland. Whatever about these, there is no doubt, however, in the case of the silver seal matrix made for one Brian O'Harney, which contains an inset gem with the head of a helmet warrior or that of John, styled Archdeacon of Cashel, County Tipperary, with the setting of a seahorse. However, further study is required on these gem set rings to identify both the gemstones and also whether they are of antique or medieval manufacture. My final selection of seals are those attached to a set of deeds preserved in the Library of Trinity College, Dublin, dating from the 13th to the 15th centuries, which I mentioned earlier. I have not yet been able to examine these, but some were illustrated by Armstrong and give an idea of the wide range of motifs employed by tradespeople and property owners. These are from the um, deeds of the parish of St. John in Dublin, located in the, in the town centre, city centre under the shadow of the Cathedral of the Holy Trinity. These included seals with simple wheel devices, such as that of Thomas Lebelund of Oxmanstown, or the more elaborate stag's head used by John the Butler. Richard St. Olaf, on the other hand, chose a fish as a motif for his personal seal. And the reason for this may be the fact that Richard is recorded in the deeds as owning property in Fishamble Street in the parish, and the advice may indicate his occupation as a fishmonger. Religious imagery in the case of the um, parish of St. John seals was preferred by ecclesiastics, such as the seal used by Brother Adam Payne, sub-prior of Holy Trinity, with an Agnes Day within branches. By that of William Brown, chapter carried an effigy of St. Catherine, a very 
this is now uh, Armstrong's drawing of the seal crowned with the wheel and palm branches and interestingly an inscription in English naming the saint Saint Catherine. However there are other examples of seals with religious devices which were used by lay people so it's not exclusive to um, ecclesiastics. It is important in the case of seal matrices to record their history and provenance and I've mentioned this earlier. Like medieval jewellery the sheer mobility of seals, the fact that they were highly sought after by collectors, and that many carry universal designs, legends, and names, which could be found anywhere in Ireland or in Britain, means that caution must be exercised in attributing an Irish provenance to those in Irish collections which have no known history. Seals of Irish ecclesiastics and nobles have also been found in England, such as the seal matrix of Thomas Barry. Bishop of Ossory, 15th century Bishop of Ossory, found in the River Thames at Southwark Bridge, now in the Museum of London. Or that of Brian O'Neill, King of Kinalone, sh shown earlier, found in the Minster Yard in Beverley in Yorkshire. How these arrived in England, we can only speculate. They could be relatively modern introductions. On the other hand, Barry may have visited London, either in his capacity as Bishop or as Treasurer of Ireland and the loss may have occurred on one such occasion. Brian O'Neill, if indeed this matrix is his, because there are several kings of Jerome bearing this name, um, was killed by the English at the Battle of Down in 1260, and it has been suggested that his seal may have been taken as a trophy, or it may even have been lost at an earlier date when Brian is said to have joined Henry III's forces in an expedition against the Scots. In conclusion, therefore, this survey of personal seals demonstrates that the Irish series in general reflect those found elsewhere in England, Scotland and Wales in terms of material, shape, size, form of legend and motifs employed. Usage was confined largely to the anglicised parts of the country where seal usage was practised. Apart from their use in ecclesiastical contexts, seals were used sparingly amongst the Irish and appear only to have been employed in dealings with the English administration whether in Dublin, London, or with Anglo-Norman Magnates and their successors. Much work remains to be done, in particular in identifying the individuals mentioned on seals, and most particularly in terms of the study of the seal impressions attached to documents, which have received no attention whatsoever. The corpus of the seals remains largely untouched, but it is now, there is now a potential to build on the digital initiatives such as those of DigiSig and the Seals in Medieval Wales project to develop a database for Irish medieval seals. It is timely that this renewed interest in Irish sigillography comes along at a time when work is currently underway on the completion of a project being developed by Trinity College Dublin in partnership with the National Archives in Dublin, Belfast and London entitled Beyond 2022. This aims to create an open access digital reconstruction of the record treasury in Dublin, destroyed in the 1922 fire, and include a virtual reconstruction of the documents, insofar as it can. It is also fitting that this revival of Irish seal studies comes at the centenary of the death of the father of Irish sigillography, Edmund Clarence Richard Armstrong, in 1923. Thank you very much. <laughs>